Well, this is Billy Humphrey from IHOP Atlanta, but now Gate City Church. Gate City Church, that's right. And uh, I mean, you don't need much introduction, but they have 24 seven prayer room and a church and a missions organization and missionaries all over the earth and in closed countries. Yeah. And man, it's just such a joy and honor to have you here with us. Oh, it's an honor to be here. I love being home with my Hop KC family. Come on. Come on. So just stretch out your hands toward him. I'm just gonna pray 20 seconds. Father, we thank you, thank you Jesus. for your servant. We thank you for Billy, Mary Beth, their children. Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in them and through them. We ask for strength and might to come. We ask for the grace of heaven, yes. the favor of the Lord, and the light of your countenance yes. to shine even this morning upon us in a greater measure. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, bud. Well, it's just an honor to be here. I so love the whole IHOP KC family. I love Mike and Diane, Isaac and Morgan, Dave and Tracy, these are all my dear friends, Stuart and Esther. These are all the dearest friends in my heart. Of course, I get to be with my bro, Corey Russell, he's gonna be in the next session, next service, so that's awesome. But uh, it's like coming home every time I get to come to Kansas City. And uh, I was sitting there thinking about the first time that I ever spoke in an uh, Encounter God service in Kansas City. Mike asked me to speak. I had been here four months, and uh, Julie Meyer had had a dramatic encounter in a dream, and uh, the Lord had uh, invited Mike to a 30-day speech fast. I'm just curious, by a show of hands, anybody here during that season? Just, okay, some of you. So. Uh, I've been here, I'd been here four months at that time, and Mike was teaching end times every Friday night. He's on a 30-day speech fast from Daniel 12 to get end time revelation, and he sends me an email. Hey, can you preach on the end times and the EGS on Friday night? Well, he's gonna sit 15 feet from me the entire time while he's waiting on an angel, and I'm like a complete newbie in the message. Like, I know nothing about end times. It was the most intimidating preaching I've ever done in my entire life. I'm just, I'm shaking and trembling the entire time, wondering if the angel is gonna show up in that moment and then begin to correct my eschatology. It was, <laughs> it was unthinkable for a first uh, preaching in Kansas City. I've had the opportunity to preach here a dozen times since maybe, but it's, that first one was just on my mind today. It was incredible. Well, I wanna... I wanna uh, release a message this morning on vulnerability in fellowship. Vulnerability in fellowship. And I'm gonna come out of John 17 and we're gonna connect it to 1 John 1. And so if you have your device uh, or your Bible, uh, go ahead and get that, get that out. I wanna walk through a few verses together. and. This is really just one aspect of what's going on in John 17. There's so many big points that Jesus releases in John 17. But one of the things the Lord has been ministering to me about very deeply over the last six months, I would say, as so many of us are, are really going, uh, putting our heart into the Upper Room Discourse. I know you're doing it here in Kansas City. We're doing it in Atlanta. But one of the things the Lord has really been ministering to me about is what it looks like to live with an open heart, to live with a vulnerable heart. And when we look at John 17, what we realize is Jesus is modeling something through prayer. He's modeling something for us that we're actually supposed to live day in and day out. And so uh, I just wanna one more time just set our eyes on the Lord and ask him to, to help. I need clarity and precision as I release this message. So Lord, here we are. I ask you, Jesus, release revelation on your word in a rich way right now. Now I'm asking you to hold my hand and let me speak as an oracle this morning to unveil in a fresh way dimensions of who you are. So open the eyes of our understanding, release light. And Lord, stand with me right now. Let me say what you'd have me to say. We give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen. So John 17, I just love it because Jesus is gonna finalize the Upper Room Discourse 
and he does something so interesting. He's, he's just released such deep drippings from his heart, and he does this interesting thing. He goes, okay, guys, come with me now, and then he just opens his eyes and looks at the sky. And then he begins to talk to the Father about their relationship, but then he's talking to the Father in front of the guys about the guys. It's an awkward prayer meeting. It just is. Because, I mean, have you ever been in a room with somebody and they are talking to someone else about you as if you weren't in the room? Well, here we have God talking to God about the disciples sitting right there, but he even broadens it. It's God talking to God even about us. And so how many times do we look through the scripture and we see little phrases that uh, we see Jesus pray in, in the gospels, just different sentences at different times. There's different passages where we see the inner Trinitarian dialogue. Psalm two is an important passage in that way. There's different ones. But we almost don't have any other passage that gives the depth of what it looks like when the Son of God talks to the Father God and when he's making intercession and he's opening his heart to the Father, John 17 would be ground zero for intertrinitarian dialogue, for the, the conversation that takes place between the Son and the Father. And just to bring it home in importance, he's not talking about, you know, dimensions of you know, this unfolding, incre ever-increasing kingdom. He is in some ways, but mostly he's talking about you and I. And that should get our attention that John 17 is a critical, critical passage for us to drink from and to, to stay, stay sustained in because these are the desires of the Son of God for us. So he does that in a, in a model to show us what it's like to be open and vulnerable with God, and by allowing us to see it, he's inviting us into that same format, okay? It's, it's not enough for us to get understanding data points on the scripture. It's gotta turn into us, yes, getting understanding, but actually stepping into it so the word becomes transcendent on the inside of us, and it is our actuality. It's how we live our lives. And I'm convinced that what Jesus does in John 17 is for that very purpose. Now, there's a bunch of dynamics. There's a bunch of things that he unfolds. Uh, it, it, it's rich with revelation, but the thing that has got my attention the most is in John 17, verse four, Jesus says, I have finished the work that you gave me. I've glorified you on the earth and I've finished the work. And I would just say for years, I looked at that passage and I, and I thought, you know, in, in a moment, he's gonna be on the cross and he's gonna say, it is finished. But here, here he is and he's saying, I have finished it now. And I'm looking at that and I go, I don't understand why you would say it's finished on the cross, but here you are in this high priestly prayer and you're saying, I finished the work. Well, it's because in verse six, he's now gonna show us the specific component of the work that he's talking about. In verse six, he says, I have manifested your name. And I would just say one of the key components of Jesus' ministry on the earth was to manifest the name and the nature of the Father to the earth. To show the earth what's the Father like. What's his character? What's his being like? What does he think like? What does he feel like? And so when Jesus is saying in 17.4, I've finished the work, the specific work he's talking about is manifesting the name of God. Now, I'll just recall you to Exodus, when Moses asks, in chapter 33, when Moses asks, show me your glory, the Lord uses a variety of terms interchangeably to let us know that God's glory is 
many faceted, but it's specific to his nature and his character. And what we end up finding out is his face, his name, his nature, his attributes, his glory, they're all used interchangeably, okay? So Jesus says, I finished the work you gave me. I've manifested your name. In a minute, he's gonna say, I've given them the glory you gave me. And so what Jesus is doing is he is pulling from that same definition of God's nature, God's name, God's glory, and he's explaining this. I have shown my disciples who you are, what you're like, and what's in the deep parts of you. I have given it to them. Now, I'm from Atlanta. We say amen in Atlanta. <laughs> I know this is Missouri. Missouri. Atlanta, we say amen. All right, so Jesus sharing the depths of the Father is Jesus sharing the glory of the Father, the nature of the Father. It's not just about a power encounter or even the Mount of Transfiguration, though those components are included. It's about him unpacking the depths of God and handing it to the disciples. And so what we, what we realize is the Son of God, he grew in stature, in favor with God in his earthly lifetime, in his earthly ministry. He grew in stature and favor with God and with men. Here's my point. Jesus was always coming to greater and greater measures of unveiling of the Father to him and of him to the disciples. In fact, Jesus was so, he was so filled with the, the revelation of the nature of the Father that he would say things to the disciples. He'd say stuff like, there's many things I want to unveil to you, but you couldn't hear it at all if I gave it to you. It's too much for you. And I'm, I'm just, I'm in awe of this interchange between the Son and the Father the, the unveiling of the heart of the Father to the Son, and then the heart of the Son to the Father, and then the heart of the Son to us. Now here's the point I wanna really make. Jesus does that so, yes, we'll see the Father, but also so he can pass to us the way that we're gonna live in this age. And what do I mean by that? We're called to live with an open, vulnerable heart to God and an open, vulnerable heart to one another. That's what Jesus modeled and that's what he called the disciples into. Now I know that sounds intense because of the hour that we're living in and the way that our social climate is, that people are, you know, they're on an, an attack you know, mode with anybody that would share anything that's not exactly the way that they would think. They go after people. They, they do character assassinations. They cancel people. And so we think, well, I can't be vulnerable because people are going to attack, attack me. I could get hurt. I could get hurt. If you look up in Webster, the definition of vulnerability, some of y'all already know the answer to this. It means putting yourself in a position where you might get hurt. <laughs> it literally means that. And there's a difference between being transparent and being vulnerable. Transparency is, I tell you there's stuff going on. I just say, that I, I, get, I went through a hard thing. I'm letting you know a little bit about what's on the inside of me. Vulnerability is I'm, I'm showing you my heart, how it's impacted me, what my emotions are, what the reality of me is, and I'm inviting you into it. And I'm convinced this is the, it is the portion for, for the believing followers, lovers of God, the portion for the church, that we would be a people that live with open, vulnerable hearts toward God and open and vulnerable hearts toward one another. So Jesus says these things. He says, I manifested your name. I've given to them your words. 
I've, I've shared with them the glory you gave me. And he points a certain direction with it. He says, I shared with them the glory you gave me so that they would be one as you and I are one. So let's just look at it. John 17, verse 20. It says, I do not pray for these alone, but for also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's all of us. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory you gave me I have given them, or the depths of you that you have shared with me, I have shared it with them, or the name, the nature, the character, the reality of who you are that you've unveiled to me, I have unveiled that to them, that they may be one just as we are one. Now, in Atlanta, I've done so many unity meetings. We have had a, an assignment from the Lord in our city to gather together the church across cultures, across denominations. And we've done, I mean, dozens and dozens of citywide prayer meetings. The largest one had 500 different pastors represented, 25,000 believers we gathered together in a solemn assembly around racial unity, around oneness. And... Um, and so we preached John 17 literally weekly for an entire year leading up to that solemn assembly. It was something that the Lord gave to us as an assignment. It was powerful how the Lord worked it all out. I, I've spent hours in John 17, but, and I wanna say boldly and, and humbly, I'm convinced oneness does not come from unity meetings. Oneness does not come from unity meetings. What Jesus is pointing to is a transcendent oneness that is far, far beyond you and me sort of getting together for a couple hours and high-fiving and hugging. I love high-fiving and hugging. I high-five and hug all the time. But what he's talking about is something that's absolutely transcendent. He's saying, the way that you and I, Father, are one with one another, I want that to be the reality between every one of my followers. He's hinting at the Holy Spirit that will be on the inside of us who will never be in opposition with himself. You gotta ask yourself, if you're in opposition with another believer, what's going on there? Because Holy Spirit's not in a fight with himself. In Atlanta, they'd say amen right there. Um, so there's that he's hinting at, but what he's drilling down on is this idea where he says, I want them to be one as we are one, as we are one. And I wanna, I wanna, put, a, I wanna uh, put a light on the term spirit of revelation for us. We use, in the house of prayer world, we use the spirit of revelation. We use that term all the time. Um, but if I, if I looked at Corey and I said, Corey, I want a spirit of revelation in the knowledge of you. I, I want my eyes opened to the depths of who you are. Yeah, you're starting to feel the awkwardness. I, I want you to unveil your heart to me, Corey. Speak to me about what you're like and what you like. I mean, by this point, it's like, bro, that's a lot. That's intense. But here's the point I wanna make. When we use spirit of revelation with God, with Jesus, we're asking a very vulnerable question. Will you, Jesus, be vulnerable with me? Will you, Jesus, unpack your heart, your feelings, your emotions with me? Will you, Jesus, bring me in to what you're like and what you like, what the Father's like? Will you show me who you are? That 
is the language of vulnerability. Do you catch this? And so when we're asking for revelation, we're asking for disclosure. I, I love John 14, 21. Jesus, if you love me and you'll keep my commandments, he goes, I will come to you and I will disclose myself to you. This is not about getting data points from the Son of God so we can stick our chest out and go, I got the spirit of revelation on me. That sounds a lot like 1 Corinthians 13. You can know all mysteries and not have love and it profits nothing. But there's something about unguarding my heart and asking him to unguard his heart and opening my heart and saying, I need you in the worst way, Jesus. Will you share what's in your heart with me? Because here's the real reality and the rawness of who I am. I am poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked, and I need you like I need air. I need you like I need the blood flowing through my veins. I can't live one more second going through this culture of self-protection and self aggrand uh, propping up. What's aggrandizement? Spirit of Mike Bickle hit me right there. Make up a word. This <laughs> is all over this pulpit. <laughs> Self-protection, self-promotion. We protect ourselves so we can promote ourselves. Be <laughs> Don't scare me like that, man. We protect ourselves so we can promote ourselves. It's what our entire social media culture is. Because if I really showed you me, I can't promote me, I can't get followers, because you wouldn't follow the real me. You wanna follow the figment of my imagination me. So what do we do? We share all of our wins, never share our losses, and nobody's real with anybody, and we live with closed hearts that are unreal, untrue. And the Son of God modeled something completely different. He said, I've borne I've born your glory with them to make them one. And the point is he's trying to call us into bearing our glory with one another. We bear our glory with the Father, we open our soul to him, and we bear our glory with one another. And see, the difference in Jesus' glory and our glory is, Jesus' glory is all beauty, all wonder, all marvel. Our glory has got a bunch of wins and losses in it. Because our glory is our depths. It's the reality of us. When we bear our glory, it looks a lot more like 2 Corinthians 10, 11, and 12. Second, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, 11, and 12, where Paul said, in my weakness, I've gotten real comfortable. He says, I delight in weakness. I delight in suffering. I, I delight when people say all things, all these persecutions against me. Because when I'm weak, God promises to meet it with power. And I'm convinced the way that we step into oneness, if I could just say it real plainly, is we've got to get real. We gotta quit putting up this false face, this posture, this pose. We gotta quit putting that out in front as the leading way that we relate and just start getting real. Sharing our wins and losses and losses and losses. We have to, because otherwise, what are we doing? We're literally operating behind a spirit of deception. All right, I'm short on time. Flip over to 1 John, and I'm convinced, so I'm, I'm throwing a lot at you. Hopefully, you maybe take a note or two. Uh, but I'm convinced John in 1 John He's operating with John 17 in mind. John 17, 13, Jesus prayed, I'm praying all this that their joy may be full. In 1 John uh, 1, verse five, he says, I'm, 
I'm telling you guys this, that your joy may be full. He's tying these points together. It's, a, it's an easy connection between John 17 and 1 John 1. And so 1 John 1, he's gonna use the word fellowship four times. And I love golf tournaments. Actually, I'm not a golfer, but I'm a bass fisherman. I love bass fishing tournaments. I, I love hangouts. I, I, I love to eat food. How many people love to eat food? I love that. Um, I love football. I, I like hanging out with my friends. But what we've actually done is we've dumbed down the term fellowship to us having a little bit of recreational camaraderie. And we've actually lost the wonder of what the Bible was offering us in fellowship. And so what you end up with is a whole bunch of people saying, I need community, I need community, because they've actually not touched any fellowship. And what John was drawing off of in John 17 was, this will make you full of joy. You don't need another hangout, you need to connect in fellowship. And fellowship is different. Fellowship is partnership and sharing with one another Koinonia, that word is probably the closest descriptor for oneness that Jesus talked about in John 17. Well, 1 John 1, John says it four different times, but look at how this works. 1 John 1, verse one, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, and he's gonna give a little parenthesis, he goes, that life was manifested, and we have seen and we bear witness and we declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Who's he talking about? Jesus, eternal life in the flesh. He goes, we handled him with our hands. We hugged him, we felt him, we heard from him and we saw him, we drank of him. He goes, that which we have seen and which we have heard, we say to you, Because you and I are in a conversation where we're sharing with one another and we're sharing what we have seen and what we have heard. We say it to you, look at this phrase, that you also may have fellowship with us. Underline the also, that you also would what? Share with us what you've seen and you've heard so that we can have fellowship is the idea so that we can be joined, so we can be part of one another. But watch what he says here. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his son Jesus. What's John, what's he saying? He's saying, when I open my heart to you and I share my glory with you, I share what I've seen and what I've heard with you, and you share your glory with me, you tell me what you've seen and what you've heard. Yes, guess what? We're gonna have fellowship, but guess who else we're fellowshipping with? We're fellowshipping with God. And this mystical understanding of I am going to experience God through you. You're gonna experience God through me. We're gonna fellowship together in a partnership of joining by the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from a closed heart. It doesn't come from us sort of going through the motions and unpacking our data points. It has to be the, the reality of us offering who we really are without being defensive, without being self-protecting, without trying to look good, to one up, to get to the next ministry level. It really has gotta get down to this. I'm a regular guy with regular issues. Sometimes I'm frustrated and that's sin. Sometimes I lose my temper with my kids and that's sin and I repent of it. I'm telling you the real thing. This isn't a, you know, a hypothetical. That's me. And God's been working on me in that. And I've shared that with my top five or 10 in my life. I said, I need you to help me to, to be godly, hold me accountable. 
I wanna be real about who I am because I want glory on my life. I want the beauty of oneness with my brothers and sisters, and I want that glory of God manifesting through me. And I wanna know the power and the anointing of fellowship, and it's not gonna come if all I'm trying to do is tell everybody my high points and never say my low points. He says the fellowship that we have with each other We're actually having that fellowship with God. Truly, our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. He goes, and I'm telling you this, that your joy would be filled. When we live isolated, lonely, separated, it's because we don't have five or 10. I'm not saying you should get up and and do some exhibitionist thing and tell all your dirt in front of the whole world. Like, I'm not saying that. I'm doing that, but I'm not saying you should. But when you have five or 10 in your world that you really tell the truth of who you are, now we're getting into fellowship. Now we're getting into oneness. Listen, you've already done this at times. You had that person over for dinner. You stayed up till three o'clock. You drank a, you know, a cappuccino too late and you're talking. And you stayed up talking and you, three o'clock in the morning came and oh my gosh. And then you know, they went home and, and you went to bed and you woke up the next morning and you go, man, I really told them a lot of my stuff. Gosh, and you felt a little awkward because you unveiled yourself, but you also felt this beauty of feeling connected deeply connected and beloved when we actually see each other that's where safety is and I want to just say this John 17 Jesus is about to be betrayed by one of his best friends and he's calling us to open vulnerable hearts there's no asterisk that says that well they might betray me so I can't be open No, he's about to be betrayed by one of his best friends. And he's calling us to an open, vulnerable heart. Well, watch where this goes. He goes now, verse five, this is the message that we've heard from him and we declare it to you. And he goes, and here it is. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And then he's gonna get in our business. He goes, now, if you want to have fellowship with him, you can't walk in darkness If you do that, you're lying. That's not reality, that's not truth. He goes, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, look what he does here in this verse seven, we have fellowship with one another. Verse six, he says, he's talking about having fellowship with God. Verse seven, he's saying we have fellowship with one another. What's he doing? He's using them interchangeably and he's describing our fellowship with one another and our fellowship with God. It's one thing. Can you see that? This is so vital, guys. This is not about a pizza and the Chiefs game today. Glory to God. (laughs) I can't even root for the Falcons this year, any of you football fans, so yeah, Kansas City might as well win it again, praise God. (laughs) Look at where this goes. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. the truth is not in us. Now we're gonna get verse nine in context. If we confess our sin, this is, I know, I, I know, I know we're all Protestants in here. I, I know we love the individual priesthood of the believer. We love that. He's not talking about, I confess to God that I sin. He's talking about if we confess sin to one another. This is James 5, James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses to one another. That we would live open and vulnerable and real and our weakness would be in front of us and that would be okay. Could you imagine that I'm weak and we're okay with it? That's where the glory comes. Paul, he's, the Lord promised Paul, he goes, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Grace is unveiled, it's unlocked in weakness and I promise power on weakness. And this is what we're called to live like. While the world is self-protecting 
and self-promoting, the church is supposed to be open, vulnerable, and delighting in weakness, real and safe with one another. This is who we're called to be, beloved, and I promise the re- I, I just really believe this strongly. The reasons why we haven't seen the glory of oneness in our midst is because we actually haven't done open, vulnerable fellowship very much at all. In that place of open, vulnerable fellowship, the Lord is fellowshipping with us. So I believe this is a, a great call for the church. I believe this has a real... Um, connect to the first and second commandment. You know, we imagine greater love has no man than this, and he laid down his life for his friend. We imagine that we will do the greater love of laying down our life for someone, you know, when the, when the heat is on. But let me, just, let me just ask this real simple thought. If I can't be honest with you about who I really am, do you think I really am gonna lay my life down for you? We gotta kind of get that fantasy out of our mind. There's a day coming where we really might be laying our lives down for one another for real, but right now, sort of the, you know, as Mike says, the push-ups we have to do is I'm laying my life down by being vulnerable with you about who I really am. And it's in that place that we become one. It's in that place that we experience the glory of oneness and the power of fellowshipping with one another and with the Father and with the Son. Amen. You can say amen. All right. Good, let's go ahead and let's stand. I'm not saying I'm good at this. I'm saying this is something that the Lord's been dealing with me about for about six months. And we're trying to normalize it in our spiritual family. What it looks like to be open and vulnerable, to be real. And I just, I wanna ask the Holy Spirit right now just to put a spotlight on us. If you've been walking around with a self-protected heart, if you've been offering your brothers and sisters a version of you that's not authentic, I, I I wanna call you into the risk of vulnerability. I'm not saying that you've gotta like, like I said, you know, do something, you know, put it all over the internet or, whatever, but I'm talking about the five or 10 relationships. That's your number one theater that you're gonna live live in 90% of your life. Your family and your five or 10 relationships where they know you, they know the real you, and you live with an open, vulnerable heart. I wanna call you out of self-protection. Some of you have been hurt badly, I understand. And you think, man, I, you, just, you hear vulnerability and transparency and you flinch. And I, that's why we need Luke 4.18 right now. That's why we need the anointing that's on Jesus to heal the heart. Good, let's, let's just set our eyes on Jesus right now. You guys can come on. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, I confess I haven't been good at this. But I wanna be. Lord, I confess I need this. I need reality. I need reality in you. I need reality in my own heart. I need reality with my brothers and sisters. God, bring us into true fellowship. So come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, shine your light on us.
depths of your love. Oh, I open up to the depths of your love. Enlarge my heart, I want it. Increase, let me contain it. Enlarge my heart, I want it. Increase, let me contain it. The depths of your love, I open. ministry time right now if you say I want to walk out of self-protection I want to risk vulnerability I know that might feel awkward I get it it is awkward but it's got to be a muscle that we get really used to using with our five or ten our our theater that we live in our family and our closest five or ten you say I want to get open-hearted and vulnerable in true fellowship and I haven't been I want to invite you forward right now I want to pray that the Lord would give us grace in this that you just come forward One of those hard altar calls. <laughs> I'm vulnerable. I'm ashamed, I'm afraid. We're gonna step out of self-protection. We're needing, we're asking the Lord for grace that we would step out of self-protection to be real, to be honest, to be vulnerable, to step into true fellowship to actually experience the grace and the beauty of oneness. Oh, come Holy Spirit. 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 Lord, give us this grace. of us that's not real I'm asking for grace right now to be true to walk in the light not just in areas of sin but in areas of weakness to offer the reality of who we are to get comfortable with it not being perfect to get comfortable with not having to wear a Christian face that acts like we're just perfect. It's messy and challenging, but God, we want a reality that we would be people with truth in the inner parts, with a lean towards righteousness, empowered by the Holy Spirit, connected in true fellowship. 
fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and one another. God, I'm asking, release that grace on Forerunner Christian Fellowship. Release it on the whole IHOP KC family. God, on the friendship groups, on the worship teams, that we'd move past just sharing our wins, but we'd share our wins and our losses and bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We'd really operate in the first and second commandment, open and vulnerable with God and open and vulnerable with one another. Lord, we ask you to do that for us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Oh, help us, give us grace to live an honest life before you. We want to walk in the Give us grace. Grace. Teach us Holy Spirit. Show us the way of fellowship. Show us the way of worship. No reservations. No walls. Let us not hold back. Show us, Lord. Show us. Sovereign Lord, bind up the broken heart. Yes. You're the one who made 